Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Good morning, Christ Central. I'm Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here. And today, our call to worship comes from Psalm 66, verse 1 through 4. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. As we gather this morning and as we worship together, let's sing these praises to the matchless name of our God. Good morning and welcome to Christ Central. My name is James. I'm one of the worship leaders here. And please join me as we sing these songs of praise to our God. Each Sunday, we want to take time to confess our sins together. And I know for a lot of us, it's tempting to want to hide or think we need to get our act together before we can come to God. If that's you, would you hear now the words of Psalm 32, 5? I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We come before God to confess our sin and we don't have to cover it because he invites us to come and confess humbly, honestly, and comprehensively. Would you join me now as we do that together? Let's pray. Would you hear now these words of pardon? Psalm 32 verses one through two says this, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in, in whose spirit there is no deceit. You see with God, we don't have to pretend or deceive ourselves into thinking we're better than we are but God invites us to come with all of our dirt, sins, guilt, and shame. And someone else covers it for us. Jesus 
with his life, death, and resurrection covers us so fully and so comprehensively. And so God sees you as he sees his son. And in light of that truth, would would you join me as we sing this next song of response? Each Sunday, we want to now confess our faith 
And it's a reminder that our faith isn't just a local one. It's not just a temporal one according to our time now, but it is a global faith and it is a historic faith. We are confessing from the Apostles' Creed and these really capture the major elements, the foundational elements of what it is that we believe. So would you join me now and let us confess together as an act of worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear CCSE, the scripture reading today comes to us from Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. So please follow along in your Bibles. I'll read for us Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. I will begin with the historical subscript, a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. This is God's very word. Thanks be to God. A very well known working summary of the book of Psalms is Life is hard. But God is good. I grew up learning this about the book of Psalms. Life is hard. I don't think I have to explain that part. But God is good. Let me suggest that Psalm 63 here changes a preposition. And takes it much further. According to Psalm 63, it seems to tell me life is hard because God is good. Life is hard because God is good. How did the psalmist discover this? How can you and I, and last we'll close with, what is this that is better than life? Life is hard because God is good. How did the psalmist discover this? How can you, and what is better than life? First, life is hard, life is hard. Uh, David, the psalmist here, is in the wilderness and he lays his soul bare. He says that he is hungry. He says that he is thirsty. He feels faint. And for some reason, he finds himself in the, in the wilderness. Now, I assure you, David, the psalmist, was not glamping. Uh, he was not up in Yosemite with all the modern anemones at your disposal if you really need it. (laughs) He was not on vacation, but he was actually running for his life. Deathly afraid, and most commentators will tell you, upon this occasion, 
He was being hunted and hated by his own son, Absalom. And you talk about a dysfunctional family. And the kind of wretchedness and shame David must have felt as a father. This is David betrayed by his own son. And this is why he finds himself faint and hungry and thirsty and scared for his life. This is probably a rock bottom moment in the life of David. The Bible tells us that even Jesus Christ himself hungered and thirsted in the wilderness. So literally or metaphorically, this happens to everyone. This happens to everyone. Now, why? Why must life be sometimes so hard? Well, let me put it this way. When do you go see a doctor? When do you all of a sudden get curious to check upon your health or the condition of your physical body? Oh, it's because God signals through our created bodies uh, something's wrong, something feels off, there's a pain here or a pain there. And then you go check it out. And God signals to us, even through our created bodies, you better pay attention to this so that you can hopefully get better. Now, how would God signal to you and I something is so wrong or off or broken with our invisible souls? Hey, my friends, how else do you expect God to get your attention that your entirety and your future eternity and your destination, you are headed completely the wrong way? To a point of no return. How would God signal that? Through an easy life? This is what C.S. Lewis observed in his book, The Problem of Pain. The settled happiness and security which we all desire, God withholds from us by the very nature of the world. The security we crave would teach us to rest our hearts in this world and oppose an obstacle to our return to God. Our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant inns, but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. If God is altogether good, if He is infinitely, perfectly good, then the worst thing God could do, according to Romans chapter 1, is to leave you to just do what you want is for God to give them over to the lusts, to our natural lusts. To go about all of life looking for success or defining your identity, looking for romance or significance or fulfillment or even freedom without God. If again, God is altogether good, all the success in the world without Him would be a curse. The worst thing that God could do in our generation is let you feel like and let you chase being on the right side of history, the right side of politics, or the right side of your peers, or the right side of your culture, without ever being concerned if you're right with Him. Hey, make no mistake, my friends. Life gets hard for everyone. But here's God's purpose. God tests his own people. He tests his own children when life gets hard to give you something better. God will never intend it for your demise. He has planned something better so that you would emerge stronger and closer to your one and only true God and become more like Jesus. Whereas the devil, yes, there is an evil being with all of his forces and hosts who roam around, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, like a roaring lion seeking to devour and to destroy. Whereas God tests you when life gets hard, the devil comes along to tempt you. Not to give you something better, but to give you something much worse to the point of no return. So which is it going to be for you? Which will it be for you? Is God still good when life gets hard? 
Is God believable? Is he trustworthy? Can you still follow him as good? Even when apparently all things around you are not good. Or do you believe that God is good only when it's going good for you? This is the first part of Psalm 63. But of course he moves on. How did he discover that God is good even when life is hard? And how can you? Look, the key to how the psalmist discovered that God is altogether good in all of life at all times is he kept going after God. He just kept going after God. He kept seeking after God. He kept coming to God. He had a disciplined, dogged pursuit. He had a disciplined, dogged pursuit. We read this in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 66 to 68. After this, many of his disciples turned back, the disciples of Jesus turned back, and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, Peter held on. He kept at it. He just put one foot in front of the other. He kept following and seeking after God, even when many around him couldn't bear to go on. So here, the psalmist did not seek after God only when he felt like it. Oh, look at verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Yes, evidently in verse 1, the psalmist felt he could not help. He was forced, driven to seek after God. There are plenty of moments in life you will feel like you might die if you don't go after God. So, of course, when you feel like you have to, my suggestion would be, you really should. Go seek God earnestly. But I think real life requires much more verse 8. Verse 8 reads this. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. My soul clings to you. That is the same Hebrew word that appears in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 upon the first human marriage between Adam and Eve in which Adam proclaimed, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave or cling to his wife. To cleave means you keep going at it, you keep going at it, you stick to it, you are faithful and you just keep doing it no matter what you feel. It's a disciplined, dogged pursuit. Oh, pastor. I, but I just don't feel it. <laughs> I just don't feel much when I try to come to God or go after God and open up his word and begin to pray. Within about 15 minutes, it feels like it's of no use. Can I ask you? Explore with me. But do you want to? What got you doing that even in the first place? Do you still keep and wanting to do that which you just started? <laughs> I'm not trying to play tricks on you. No, I'm just trying to teach and explain the Bible to you. Because here's what the Bible says. You are not capable of any of this desire or any of this pursuit or any move toward God if it's not God himself who first moved after you. The only reason in verse 8 the psalmist could cling is because God was upholding him by his right hand. You hunger and you thirst and you ache and you miss the presence of God and you desire more of God. Why? Why would you desire any of God? Why would you desire more of God? It's because God himself so desires and is coming after you. Look, if you're really, really sick or you're dead, you have no appetite. But if you are spiritually alive and there is any stirring or hunger or thirst, it is a sign of life. And who do you think put it there? If you are missing the presence of God, if you are mourning over the seeming absence of God, the Bible would say it's actually because of the imminent presence of God in your life. 
Show me a person who longs for God. And the Bible will tell you there's a person who's in love with God. Do you ever hear of people who are discontented and not satisfied with their present spiritual experience? Well, I'll tell you, that's a person who wants to love God much more. (laughs) A person who misses what it used to be like. A person who keeps coming after God. A disciplined, dogged pursuit. Please don't give yourself that much credit. God is that disciplined and he's that dogged. He's coming after you. So just do these two practical disciplines with me, would you? We just began the Psalms. We've also begun a scripture reading plan through the summer, which I cannot recommend more highly. Do these two things from verse six. Let me read it for us. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. First practical discipline, remember Remember, remembrance in the watches of the night, throughout the night. You know, what you do in secret, what you do when you are all alone, is really who you are. For the psalmist, in the watches of the night upon his bed, he remembers. And then second, he says he meditates. What is me- meditate? That's all, this is all it means. Just put it on repeat. Put it on repeat. Pastor Daniel Penn preaching from Psalm 34 last week says, how can you rediscover and experience the goodness of God? You got to put certain things on repeat. Meditate. Remembrance and repetition. Remembrance and repetition in a disciplined and dogged way. And see what happens. Oh, in this season, yes. Maybe... Maybe it might be that God wants you and I to learn to discipline ourselves individually well. And I cannot promise or guarantee you that you will all of a sudden then experience God in the ways that you are expecting to. It might take 30 days. It might take 30 months. Some of you might take 30 minutes. But here's all I know. Charles Spurgeon would observe this. No man ever desired Christ in his heart with the living and longing desire who did not find him sooner or later. And there is great, great help on the way. Oh, I assure you. It's called the means of grace. If worshiping and praying and listening together in person from the words of God and singing of the praise of God and taking communion, the bread and the cup, If your soul aches for this, that's because you must be a person in love with Jesus and his people, the church. Life is hard because God is good. How did the psalmist and how can you discover that God is good even when life is hard? Even when you don't feel it? A discipline and dogged pursuit. Remembrance and repetition. Let's close with this. What is better than life? What is this that erupted in the psalmist's soul to exclaim and to sing in such magnificent poetic prose? I have found something better than life. Oh, you can dismiss this expression, as I just said, as just a musical type of uh, letting go, you know, letting go of your soul and your emotions. But I would think that the Bible, if you read the rest of it, if it's really something better than life, it shouldn't be less than real life. See, what are our physical senses? Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. The Bible often uses vivid and sensory language for if and when you become a Christian you are enabled to actually sense something that is better than life. Two signs you sense something better than life. Two signs that you are sensing this. First, it satisfies. You really enjoy it. (laughs) I mean, in this day and age, you can see all kinds of pictures of food. 
you feel confined, you can't travel as much, you don't, can't go to your favorite restaurants anymore in so-and-so city or town. So you just kind of dream and you're almost, you're, you, you start drooling, looking at these pictures of food. Or you dream about food, you can read about food, you can look at old pictures of food. You can even watch someone eating lots of food virtually. But then there comes a day, you actually sit down, and better than the movie Matrix, you're not imagining it. You actually put that juicy, oh, nutrient, savory piece of steak in your mouth, and you chew and you eat. It's worlds apart. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. This is how the psalmist describes it. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Fat and rich food. Scripture, or the things that God can taste that good, it is like fat and rich steak. It satisfies his soul. Does it? Does it? Do the scriptures satisfy you like this? This is the first sign that you sense there's something better than life. Here's the second sign. It strengthens you. Not only does it satisfy you, but it strengthens you. Oh, a glorious passage from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 through 16. God likens himself, shows you his heart in this way. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? I dare you to try to get in the way of a nursing mom. The ferocity, the protection, the possessiveness, the intensity you will be met with. God goes on to say through the prophet Isaiah, even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Listen, my friends, when you get to sense the savory, rich, fat truths of these kinds of words, you feeling forgotten and alone will fade. When you really taste and sense the sovereignty of God, it becomes more real than your present worries and fears. When you get to taste the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will calm and cure all your guilt and all your shame. For the psalmist here, when he got to sense the power and the glory of God, it changed him on the spot. So look at verses 3 and 4. This is really not only how Psalm 63 culminates, but this is how the whole book of the Psalms or the Psalter ends. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Oh, my friends, every wilderness, every feeling, every song, every prayer, every mountaintop, every heartache, every valley of the shadow of death that you may be walking through ends like this. This is how the whole book of the Psalms end with praise and with us lifting up our hands. Why? Because God is altogether good. And how does it end this way? <laughs> what exactly is this that is better than life? Well, he tells us in that verse, did he not? The psalmist got a whole new sensation. He got a whole new satisfaction. He got a whole new type of strengthening from the very love of God. It is a steadfast love of God. That is a loaded Hebrew word, chesed. There is no English word or collection of words that can put, put together, that could capture the meaning and the power of chesed love, but I'll do my best. You can hear it in wedding vows. You might better understand what chesed love is by seeing how it works. Because in vows, in marital vows, you say something like, for better or for worse, I will be there. For richer or for poorer, 
my entire financial livelihood, my future lies with you? In sickness or in health, or till death do us part, I promise to be always yours. When the psalmist got a new sensation with spiritual senses of the Hesed love of God, he lost it and he erupted in praise and lifted up his hands. Even in the wilderness when life was hard. In our church history in 1851, Alan Gardner, an English missionary, was shipwrecked with a number of people off a remote island of South America. And he was the last one left alive. And they had found that he had kept a journal. And his very last entry recorded and recited Psalm 34, verse 10, which again we heard last week, which reads, The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. As Alan Gardner was dying, who had set out to become a missionary, but he couldn't even accomplish or fulfill that. And everyone around him had died, fully well knowing that he would never see his family again. In his journal, he wrote, I am overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. Alan Gardner was overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. You see, you and I derive that God must be good based on circumstances, evidences, results, fruit, and feelings. But Alan Gardner must have gotten it direct. Gardner must have gotten it direct. A chesed type of love from God that is not derivative. It's not the goodies that he could bring. Because evidently there was nothing good around him. But yet he was overwhelmed with the sense of the goodness of God. Oh, how I long to love God like that. How I long to love God like the psalmist. Direct from and directly to him. Because this is exactly how Jesus Christ came after me. The gospel is that God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to come after me directly. There was nothing he could gain. My debt bankrupted him. My disease, it's called sin, made him fatally sick and it crushed him. And all the times I want to forget and excuse and be distracted and addicted and substitute everything else but God and get rid of God out of my life, it did not prevent Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God, my Savior, from substituting himself directly for me. This is how Jesus Christ came after me. And in him, directly in him, you and I can have a sense of the chesed love and goodness of God. If you feel like me so often that you have nothing good that you can bring, there's nothing good that you can contribute, you find nothing attractive about yourself for Jesus to want to love you, that's great. Listen to me close. That's great because that's the only way he comes after you. <laughs> nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Nobody is better at Hesed love, than Jesus was. Nobody is, is better at Hesed love than Jesus was. He is better than anyone is at anything else in all of time. So you can count on it if you simply come and seek him and go after him and say, I am in utter need of you. 
Because the love of God in Jesus Christ is better than life, God is good if he brings you to him. Hmm? If he moves and woos you even in the wilderness. If he gets your attention, provokes some interest. And if he brings you to his son, Jesus Christ, that is better than life. And God will do whatever it takes. So you know today, right here, right now as you listen to the word of God, you can come to Jesus and simply ask him to come into your life. You can say, Jesus, I give you my life and I want you to fill me with your love that is better than all of life. I am yours. I want to belong to you. I want to follow you. And if you do do this today, please share it with one of our leaders or pastors. We'd love to pray and follow up with you. And I assure you, Jesus Christ, he loves, he loves to love on you. Because he lived and died and he got up from death. He came all the way back from the dead to come after you. Life is hard. But it's because God is good. And Jesus Christ gave up his own life to give you something better than yours. He gives up himself. It's much better than yours. Please come and take it. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, whether we earnestly seek you. Or whether we feel so dry and parched. Whether we feel movement toward you. Or some for quite some time have never felt a movement toward you. Lord Jesus. Please come. And do your work. Of bringing people to yourself. By your supernatural power. And through the movement of your chesed love. Hear us we pray. Oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ Central, let's sing this song together now in response to God's word.
ocean fill and where the sky a parchment made for every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe I train to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky oh love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong he shall Saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. He shall forevermore endure the saints and angels. Dear brothers and sisters of Christ Central of Southern California, how I miss you. It seems like a mirage since we last met together. Allow me to read much of this letter uh, as my personal update with you. God has good purposes for every time and season and trial that he allows us to go through. As I publicly shared and stand by to this day, there is no better church for me. Sunny, my daughters Taylor and Elizabeth, love Jesus and his church sincerely on account of you. My family has also recently been able to share with me to heal my soul in a lot of different ways that my being your pastor as of yet, hasn't completely got, gotten in the way or ruined uh, my callings as a husband and father. Praise be to God for that. But I want to share with you today, I am wearied. I feel my weariness down to my bones. As far as I can tell, this weariness is not the result of any incident uh, frustration or falling out relationally or scandal. Uh, it's also not a recent development uh, given the two current crises of COVID-19 and the tensions over racial injustice that we have all been impacted by on different levels. In some, I think I'm feeling the accumulation of 13 years as a senior pastor. From a macro point of view, at least four significant transitions have occurred since I accepted a call to pastor the English ministry of Cerritos Presbyterian Church back in June 2007. The English ministry of CPC became a full-fledged independent, make our own mistake, forge our own way, cast our own vision, govern ourselves church called CCSC. And we've grown at least from a small to a medium and now a large and thriving church with all kinds of celebrations and complications that come with change in size. Along the way, I've experienced the mountaintop highs, the most exquisite blessings with you, along with heartbreaking losses with you. Down in the valley of the shadow of death, I've felt the mountains and what it's like down below. You have become nothing less than like my family. It's the way it's meant to be according to the scriptures. You are very much akin <clears throat> to a third child. Third child, don't be insulted I said it that way, but our church is still very young. And so I have been struggling with... Uh, trying to not bring a lot of my work home. As much as I tried to neatly compartmentalize the growing and continual needs 
of church life from my home life? I, I haven't. And so over time, I've come to prioritize and idolize pastoring. Pastoring is one of the highest and joyous and one of the most privileged callings anyone can receive, but I believe I've come to idolize it. And much of my weariness stems from this. And so upon sharing my condition for prayer in late June, our session turned around with full and immediate empathy, encouragement, support, friendship, love, and even proactive actions. And recently they've come around to unanimously recommend that I take a three-month sabbatical. In God's providence, it happens to be time for my sabbatical as this is my 14th year and I will gratefully accept it as I feel my need for it from August 1st to November 1st of this year. This sabbatical in particular will concentrate in an extended way upon rest, reflection, reading, and seeking godly counsel. My dear friends, do not assume, assume that taking a sabbatical is abnormal or that it signals something is drastically wrong on either end. As far as I know, again, burnouts are sanctifying and inevitable, especially for pastors. And for me, I often do wonder what it would be like if pastoring was not the whole of my identity and worth. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, When Christ who is our, your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That tells me Jesus Christ is supposed to be my life. Jesus Christ is supposed to be the whole of my life. Jesus gave up his life better than any other idol rather than taking mine. And so I do want to live it all out for him. Otherwise, his life, the life of Jesus, will not flourish in me or in yours as your pastor. What allows me much liberty and comfort to share this now is because overall CCSE is healthier, healthier than ever before. Uh, it's, she is still somehow growing by the grace and by the move of God. And I am surrounded by with a dream team of staff, session, officers, leaders, members, volunteers who just love on me and my family so well. I'm very prone to doubt myself, but I do not doubt Christ's centrality and marvelous work here. Lord knows how much his love, how much of his love has grown in me for you. So would you pray with me that we would all trust and grow into and rest that this church is in the best of hands. Ultimately, it's in nail-scarred hands who will never let us go. I am most affectionately and undeservingly yours, but a weakened pastor and brother, I thank you for who you are and everything you've done. Psalm chapter 115 verse 1 says, Not to us, oh, not to us, O oh Lord, be, your, be the glory, but to you. Not to us, but to you be all the glory. Thanks for listening. Dear CCSE, before I pronounce a benediction upon you, I would like to specifically acknowledge and express my gratitude and my affection for the Spurlock family. Christian Spurlock, who has been not just faithful, but absolutely one of our finest on our staff. We're not quite sure what we're going to do without him. But this will be his final week serving with us as he and Alora have discerned. It is better. It's time to move forward as they want to find a church in which their whole family can attend and grow with. Oh, Christian Lord, we do love you, and we will miss you. You're welcome always back. 
We praise God for Lacey and for Leah. Laura, you're very lucky. You have like a second mom. Lacey is what, two or three going on 13. What a beautiful family you have. And as you are sorely missed, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the kind of character and humility and perseverance and just grace, the graciousness that you have blessed my life and our church's life with. We thank you. Please, please, I hope we can run into one another. Again, not run. We shouldn't run into each other, right? It's COVID, but anyhow, hopefully that day will come. All right, but receive this benediction now. CCSC and the Spurlock family. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine down upon you and be so gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining our online worship service. My name is Sarah, and I'm one of the staff members here at Christ Central. My name is Jordan, and I moved up to youth group this summer. Although we couldn't meet in person, we're thankful you were able to join us today online. If you're joining us online today for the first time, please let us know by filling out a Connect card on our website. We would love to reach out and connect with you. For offering, you can give online or by texting 84321. You can also mail in a check to our church office. We have two important announcements today. The first is the commissioning service for the Nam family. David and Susanna Nam, with their three beautiful children, are preparing to go to Taiwan next month for long-term missions. Christ Central's commissioning service for them will be on July 31st at 8 p.m. You can join us by going to our YouTube channel or going to ChristCentralSC.com slash commissioning service. Next is our monthly prayer meeting. Our monthly prayer meeting is on August 7th at 8 p.m. We're doing something a little different this time. Instead of a pre-recorded YouTube video, we'll be having a live prayer meeting on Zoom. You'll have to register at ChristCentralSC.com slash prayer meeting to get the Zoom link. We hope that all of you can join us. For additional announcements, please visit us at our church website. You can also sign up for the weekly e-newsletters and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. As discussed in our congregational meeting last week, we will continue with online worship services for the immediate future and update you with any changes. In the meantime, let's continue to check in with one another, uh, connect with one another, and of course, pray for each other. Have a great week, and we look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday. God, God bless. bless. Bye.